Man, this pool is super nice. Kids playing in the water, great weather. These steps right here are perfect for me to sit down, read a nice book, and shave a little hair off my legs, just like I saw that woman do on the internet. Do you live, eat, and sleep in the hotel industry? Looking to brush up on your game? You've come to the right place. Welcome to No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman. I'm I'm rolling on my end. One. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the No Vacant 2 podcast with me, Glenn Hausman. I'm excited to have you here today, and thanks for coming along on this journey that we've been going through over the last two years. I'm really excited because so many more of you folks are uh, catching on to the show, and if you're listening to this show by just uh, clicking on a link, subscribe to our newsletter. Text the word HOTEL to 66866. Easy enough. Just type the word HOTEL and text that to 66866, and be all, be sure to check out NoVacancyNews.com. Now, before we get going be remiss to say but this show if i didn't say this part this show is brought to you in part by duetto the revenue strategy technology platform that thousands of hotels are using to make more money and be sure to check out a great interview i did with their ceo patrick bosworth super great guy super smart guy you're going to learn all you need to know about revenue strategy and find out um, how duetto can help you go check out getrevenueresults.com GetRevenueResults.com. And if you go to NoVacancyNews.com, click on their ad and you'll get access to the blueprint for taking back business from the OTAs. And I know you all want to do that because you get a higher rate of return on getting those guests in-house. So I'm just sitting back here, just sharing in the groove, and I've got my uh, producer, Jeff Polly, uh, joining us today. And we're going to talk about a fun topic. Jeff, how are you, man? Hey, I'm uh, I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing I'm doing great. Exciting to have you you back. You know, um, I always enjoy these shows that we get to do uh, together, and um, it just it's just fun and exciting. And I wish we should do these more often. I uh, you got to talk to the the producer about getting you on more often. Well, I don't know. I mean, you're just so busy with uh, you know it, interviewing all these super important people. Why do you want to talk to little old me? <laughs> well, first of all, I think you are super important, and plus the content that uh, you find and bring to the show whenever you're on is uh, fun and exciting for sure. Yeah, Glenn, I try to make uh, you know every list that we come up with and every topic that we come up with kind of exciting, and uh, you know uh, that way I don't seem as boring as I actually am. Uh, yeah, well, I could I could speak uh, the the truth, and man, you are boring. Hanging out with you is uh, is rough stuff. There, uh, each and every time we get together. Yeah, you know, uh, dogs, hockey, Southern California. That's pretty much uh, about it. I do like to I do cook some pretty good meals, but uh, you know. I am a boring 42-year-old man. Yeah. Well, uh, fortunately, uh, when I do get together with Jeff, the one thing that we do share is our passion for chicken and waffles. And we always try to find a great place to eat uh, some of those out there. That's a little bit unusual. But I think what's more unusual, Jeff, is you, um, you brought us a great list today to talk about unusual hotels. I did the world's most unusual hotels. And I'm going to like come out there right now and say it. 
I'm going to mispronounce some of these. Uh, it's just, you know, beyond my educational level to uh, be able to get all these words. But uh, yes, Jeff, a, Jeff was actually um, homeschooled by um, blind and deaf uh, Amish people. <laughs> and he went all the way through the, uh, the, the second grade doing that. So uh, I understand you're working with limitations. Yeah, you know, uh, it takes me about 36 hours to write a post on Facebook, so that's why I don't write that much. Right. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so before we get started, I got to say, I've been watching um, I've been watching this show on Netflix called Life Below Zero, and um, one of the people featured in this show, she lives all the way up in like the tippy top most part of uh, Alaska, and she runs a place called Kavik River Camp, and she spends 300 days alone a year, but there are two months a year that people come in to do... Um, um, you know, either uh, scientific troops or uh, hunters and that sort of thing, and they stay there. I'm thinking that's a pretty unusual hotel and has got me excited about this particular uh, topic today, the idea of going to the middle of nowhere to stay uh, somewhere so remote. Yeah, that sounds pretty unusual, kind of like our first hotel on the list, a uh, little segue there, but um, Tree Hotel in Harad, Sweden. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's located in a pine forest around Harad, and uh, it's features seven unique tree rooms and these tree rooms include like a glass capsule like cabin uh and a lifelike bird's nest and each one of them has like a reflective micro cube and a, a, a almost kind of ufo type feel to it there's even um there's even a tree sauna at this tree hotel in Sweden. That's pretty cool. I, I It totally looks like a, a UFO to me if you're watching it. That classic 1940s, 50s style of UFOs. The kind that you would think would uh, come to America and terrorize us with uh, robots that say Klaatu, Barad, and Nikto. Those, kind of, uh, those kinds of people. Um, and yeah, I like to keep my references uh, really on point. If you guys know what I'm referring to by that reference, let me know. Because it is from the 1950s or 60s. Though, it was remade by... By a movie in starring Keanu Reeves. So yeah, man, I love the idea of going out and staying in the middle of a forest somewhere in Sweden. That's pretty cool. That's pretty remote. I love that there's a ladder that goes and you can load in from underneath the UFO type uh, sphere. Pretty awesome kind of stuff and definitely unusual, Jeff. Yeah, you know, to to me, every hotel on this list is going to offer something unique to where it makes the guests experience a memorable experience. I mean, I, I have just a, a, a huge number of stories of, of hotels that I've stayed at where it was just this really cool, unique experience. And, and I will always carry that story with me. It won't be necessarily about the city or what we did in the city, but like one of the first things that I'll talk about is you know, say someone's going to Istanbul and I'll, I'll be like, Oh, you totally have to stay at this hotel in Istanbul. It's amazing. And if I was, uh, in Amsterdam, the next hotel on my list, I think I'd be down for it because, uh, a view of that beautiful city at this place sounds pretty awesome. Cause this is the crane hotel for a dollar. And, uh, the word crane, um, it's actually a three bedroom hotel in a converted crane that uh, sits over the city. Yeah, that's pretty uh, awesome, and I'm sure you've seen this. Uh, my good buddy, uh, Anthony Melchiori, who um, I'm launching a podcast show very soon. I promise we're really launching it soon. Um, he did a show, uh, Extreme Hotels, and some of these hotels were covered in there, one of which was the uh, Crane Hotel for Alda. I love it. Super cool. I'm a little scared about the whole idea, though, of uh, climbing up a ladder in order to get to my room that's uh, really super high up there, and I'm wondering if I even have the uh, the, the metal to be able to, to do that without freaking out well i know your uh love for disney world and disneyland and the fact that you think like space mountain is the most extreme adrenaline uh, <laughs> pumping thing in the world <laughs> so i can see why the crane hotel is not uh, not your bag of uh you know all right i want i want everyone to know right now that jeff is putting my manliness here on the line and uh i do love space mountain but jeff i have ridden king to Ka, the world's tallest roller coaster, which is located at Six Flags Great Adventure, well over 400 feet. Now, that thing is scary. And uh, I had a good time doing it, but I didn't have to climb a ladder, so I guess you got a point. 
<laughs> so I guess the next question is, uh, you would be worried about climbing a ladder. Would you, how would you feel about staying in the middle of the English channel? I think that would be, that would be pretty cool. I mean, I've been on a cruise ship, so I know what it's like to be in a, you know, on an object that's in the middle of the water where you can't see any land. But this one sounds really interesting to me. Why don't you tell us about it? Yeah, so this is a No Man's Fort Solent Portsmouth. And uh, No Man's Fort is a Victorian era fort that was originally built uh, between 1876 and 1880 to protect Portsmouth uh, from a, an attack from Napoleon. And this has been turned into a luxury hotel with 22 bedrooms, a lighthouse, a penthouse suite, a nightclub, a hot tub, and even a laser quest arena. A laser quest arena. That's pretty cool. Now, he did say it's in a town called Solent, Portsmouth. Don't worry. He didn't say Soylent, so it's not a hotel made of people. You don't have to uh, worry about getting uh, mixed up and fed to, uh, you know, to other guests if you if you stay at this hotel. I love it. it it's really cool. I worry a little bit about uh, coming back from that nightclub, though, in the evening and falling off into the English Channel if I've enjoyed myself too much. Yeah, well, and then as far as the Laser Quest arena, maybe you can reenact the Battle of Waterloo after the nightclub. (laughs) Well, I hope not, because that didn't really work out too well (laughs) for Napoleon. (laughs) So hopefully uh, hopefully my stay at this hotel will work out a little bit better for me. Um, Man, I love that we're breezing through this list. What's the next one? Uh, New Zealand. Uh, let's go all the way, uh, basically across the globe, unless you're a flat earther and then you're just going straight or whatever they think, uh, their theory is, but, uh, well, Silo I think, State, oh, how does that flat earth thing thing work? Is it just like playing the game asteroids? When you go off one side, you magically appear on the other side of the screen. You know, everything that I've seen, there's like different flat earth theories, some some of them think it's a disc. Some of some of them think it's a square. Who knows? Some of them thinks that Antarctica is a big ice wall that's guarded by NASA. You know, uh, I'm, I might believe that theory because I do hear the White Walkers are on the other side of that wall and they're coming for us. So thank God NASA's blockading nice. that. N- Nice Game of Thrones reference. Hey, thank nice you. Yeah, yeah, you know, I'm trying to... At least that one's topical, unlike my 1980s video game reference and 1950s movie reference. So I'm going to try to keep it in the 21st century for the rest of this show. Well, <laughs> we'll, well see. in case you're a Lord of the Rings fan and you want to go to New Zealand and see where they filmed a lot of Nor- uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, Silo State Little River in New Zealand. Uh, mm-hmm. It's su- situated on the Little River. Um and it's just 350 yards from uh, Christchurch Little River Rail Trail. Silos Day offers uh, an, an innovative, eco-friendly accommodation on New Zealand's uh, Banks Peninsula. And <clears throat> uh, basically, you're staying in old silos that have been converted into, uh, into great little hotels. They have uh, gourmet microwave meals or takeaways. And, and it's truly the ultimate outdoor experience for a beautiful country i wonder how that works um gourmet microwave meals i've never heard gourmet and microwave (laughs) put together in the same (laughs) sentence unless they were trying to sell me something really bad in a uh in a supermarket food i think the only time we've ever heard gourmet and microwave together is on a plane and we all know how that goes right Uh, it's the same thing as luxury apartments that you always see that uh, are not luxury at all, although they are apartments. And, uh, you know, while we're talking about Silo Stay, I think uh, Silo Stay might have been uh, Sauron's apprentice from the uh, from the Lord of the Rings. So I'm thinking there's even more of a tie-in than we're, we're thinking about here. Right, right, right. So, uh, so on to the next one. Um, you know I'm a big dog lover, and, and you're a big cat lover. So this one's probably not a up your alley but it's right up my alley well hold on uh, it's not that i don't love dogs i just happen to own cats because it's easier between my uh, travel schedule my um, kids incredible lack of interest in uh, house pets and the actual hard work that you have to do walking your animals all of the time i stick with the cats they're easy to deal with so i just want to get that i just want to get out there that i am a dog lover i aspire to owning a dog one day maybe upon retirement 
you're you're really into defending yourself on this episode, by the way. Well, I really, I gotta, I gotta tell you, I, I'm really feeling I'm I'm being attacked quite per- personally here. I'm used to it on uh, you know social media, but coming coming from you, Jeff, it's it hurts a little bit. I gotta admit, I well, gotta admit. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna say it. I've known <laughs> yeah. I've known you for a long time, and I just don't think that you're that would be that into it. But I would be super into going to oh, Idaho. Yeah, and and staying at the Dog Bark Park Inn, and uh, this hotel is owned by uh, a bunch of chainsaw artists that literally created a B and B and shaped it out of a beagle. So it is a two story, uh, three bedroom air or B and B that is shaped like a dog. And you actually get into, uh, looking at the picture into it, you get into, uh, into the B and B by going through the dog's butt. So that's interesting. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's really funny. Um, <laughs> you, I'm looking at the picture and you do enter in through, uh, the, the back of the, the, the dog. So I guess uh, there's some sort of head up your, you know, a word joke in there somewhere, but I'm not going to make it because I am too classy. It reminds me of um, if, I don't, if any of you have ever been to Atlantic City, just north of the city is Margate, and they have Lucy the Elephant there, which is a six story elephant um, novelty piece of ar- architecture made of uh, wood and tin way back from the 1880s. You can't stay in it, but it's pretty cool. Reminds me of this uh, this dog hotel. Um, sounds like it'll be a, a lot of fun to stay in this place. Yeah, like I said, I don't think, uh, you know, you would go out of your way to stay there. But uh, for me, looking for a pet-friendly place to stay, I would take my dogs there and and probably really enjoy it. And yes, it is pet-friendly, as Jeff was saying. All right, what else do we got? So uh, going back over to the pond, over to Europe, and, and I'll just say that I love how a lot of European hotels use their space and, mm-hmm. and are innovative in, in their design and, and try to stand out from the normal places. And, and this place, you know, sounds really cool in Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, it's called the V8 Hotel. And v- V8, kind of like, um, oh, I should have had a V8. Yeah, I'm thinking more along the lines of car engines instead of tomato juice flavored oh, products. I, so it's not a hotel based on vegetable juice. It's uh, based on cars. Like Correct. An engine. It's, oh, I yeah. Know. yeah. Oh, so, right. so, so if you're a car fanatic, um, all the rooms are themed around the automobile. And it features, you know, vintage cars, racing para- paraphernalia, and even drive through cinemas. And looking at the drive picture through here, cinema, I get a drive in cinema, but a drive through cinema. What do you watch? Like <laughs> three seconds of it every single time you pass by or something like that. Hey, That's got to be a very short movie. Um, hey, what was Europeans the name? What was that? Vine. I guess uh, if you're if you were a Vine creator, this is a new place to show off your your stuff. It's about the same length. <laughs> Yeah. So so looking at the picture and I think we'll probably provide the link to the list uh, on the website, but uh, it's got this really cool, you know, old looking 70s car that's been converted into a bed. Um, And I think we all wanted one of those race car beds when we were kids, right? Uh, I never had one. I always wanted one. I actually sleep in one right now. But, uh, you know, it's a little uncomfortable uh, for, you know, for my wife and all, considering she does not have a race car bed to, uh, to sleep in. <laughs> who, get, who gets the steering wheel side? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I, I, I guess it depends on the day, right? I, I mean, you, you know, she, she likes to think she's the boss, so maybe she, she drives. But, uh, you know, I like to be in a, I like to sleep, a, in, you know, finally bringing new words to, uh, hey, he's asleep behind the wheel. It's okay. <laughs> it's actually legitimate. I knew I'd get something out there. All right. So, <laughs> so stick it, sticking with the European crazy use of space theme, uh, Linz, Austria, they have mm-hmm. a place called the Das Park Hotel. And uh, I, 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 I don't know my Austrian, but I'm assuming Das Park Hotel means the Park Hotel. And uh, I think you this, might be onto something there. This is um, actually sewage pipes that have been renovated, and thankfully they've actually been cleaned. Um, <laughs> and 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 these sewage pipes sit on the banks of the Dunabi, uh, and. I, mean, I think it's it, a Dan, the Danube. 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 Yeah. 
Sorry, I was thinking Africa for a second there. Yes. Uh, and and this makes a perfect. Uh, Dunabe is industrial- actually my favorite African singer. Uh, he's uh, <laughs> <laughs> he he trained with Mongolian throat singers and went back uh, to Africa and uh, you know made it his own. Anyway, go on. And I'm feeling attacked now, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so this makes a perfect post-industrial uh, bolt hole hotel. I mean, it literally is a, you know, let's call it six by six oval sewage pipe that has converted, been converted, sitting in the middle of a park into a hotel room, and that, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, also a perfect place to, I guess, uh, hide out in the event a nuclear bomb is going to drop because it looks like it'll protect you from, from something like that as, as, as well. So pretty cool, interesting-looking stuff. And definitely, if you stay in this bolt hole type hotel, you're going to have a great story to tell. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I think we've, uh, you know, most people have been to New York and one of the biggest attractions in New York to go see is the Guggenheim. And not only for the art that's in it, but the architecture of the building itself, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so uh, especially the one um, that I guess we're talking about Spain now was in Bilbao. Um, That building has just become so iconic. It's almost become uh, symbolic of the entire city itself. Yeah, and and that's exactly what we're talking about, the Hotel Marquis de Riscal. Uh, and it's Frank Gehry's first and only hotel project. And it's right in the heart of Spain's wine-growing region. And again, it you know has a Guggenheim-type uh, architectural feel. And looking at the picture, it's just an absolutely amazing building and, and quite unusual. Right. Think that Bilbao Museum. Think um, I think Gary also did the Disney Center in L.A., which has got that same sense of aesthetic to it. Um, A a lot of curves with titanium as opposed to uh, rigid, straight corners and lines. Although there's some of that. It's kind of like a mix between classical Spanish architecture and uh, a modern look and and feel. Pretty, uh, Pretty cool looking stuff. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. So uh, this is also cool, and this is kind of a, a little bit of history, and I, I think this is cool. But uh, Quintel Real Zacater- Z- Zacatecas uh, in Mexico, and uh, this was built— I, I, I'm going to say Zacatecas? Zacatecas, right? I yeah. don't know. It, uh, Quinta pre- Real Zacatecas. That's what I'm, I'm going to guess. I, I pre-warned everybody about my pronunciation uh, skills. It doesn't mean that we can't try to <laughs> find the correct pronunciation <laughs> as we go. I'm not sure I got the right pronunciation either, but I'm going to say it with confidence and pretend it's so. There you go. Uh, so this was built around a restored 19th century San Pedro bullfighting ring. And just the picture itself looks absolutely amazing. I mean, it, it's just this beautiful oval uh area last bull run was in 1975 and now the uh you know the hotel's restaurant now looks over the old arena and uh just seems like it takes you back into old mexico so i guess then you could say you don't have to worry about any bullshit when you uh visit this hotel sorry i had no choice people i had no choice i had a good easy um, joke i know (laughs) All right. So it's really absolutely gorgeous. This is totally the type of place I would want to stay when I'm in Mexico because it really um, feels like it's a real authentic Mexican experience. And it is authentic because it was actually a used facility. And, you know, I love these adaptive reuse projects, especially when you could do something so cool by turning a, um, a former arena into an amazing hotel that I think is really uh, really has the spirit of the culture of Mexico that's part of it. Pretty awesome. Yeah, exactly. And that's what, uh, you know, stay in hotels is all about, creating memorable experiences, right? Yeah. All right, so do let's we, do... Let's do we do, have time one more? I was going to say, more? let's do one more. I think okay. um, I want to know which one of... There's still a bunch on the list, and we'll give you guys links to this list um, from the Telegraph uh, UK um, so you can check out all of these hotels, see the great pictures, and find out which ones we didn't include here. And they're cool. They're unusual. Pretty awesome. What's your last pick for today's show, Jeff? So my last pick is one that, to me, it's important because it's not only happening in this one place, but it's happening in uh, other areas of the world. Like, uh, for example, Helsinki just announced that they're introducing their own sleeping pods. But uh, Capsule Value Conda in Tokyo, Japan, is 
a capsule hotel and it's literally just a, a small little capsule yeah, i think right. think almost almost on a spaceship and you're you know going to sleep for 40 years while you're traveling to somewhere and this is a economical uh way to go to a place like tokyo or helsinki which is again uh really expensive and they're about 30 bucks a night to get a good night's sleep in a little tiny capsule that even has a tv in it yeah i think you meant 30 uh, pounds uh per night because it's a british uh, article but i will say jeff i really loved your uh your your vision for the utopian future where we're going across the cosmos and people are sleeping for 40 years. My thought was it really looks like the refrigerators in a morgue, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I like your, your positive attitude over there. And what's uh, really cool is, uh, you know, Japanese culture, you've got the whole uh, idea of uh, salary men having to go out and have lots of drink, drink, drinkies. And if you've had just a little too many and getting home to your, uh, to your apartment is a little too much, just pop yourself into one of these capsules and then you'll, uh, you'll be able to sleep it off and move on with your life super claustrophobic though but i think i would have a real um fun time staying in one of these also reminds me of um sleeping apartments in rail cars right it's the same kind of uh feel and and size yeah absolutely and i honestly would pay money and good money to see you climb up into that second floor capsule like (laughs) that well, let's see. It's thirty pounds a night. I charge fifty pounds a night for uh, going up the uh, the steps in there, and then uh, so I got that because I gotta you know I gotta pay for my sake somehow there, Jeff Polly. So, so the the uh, one time I think the last time I was over in Tokyo, my wife and I we decided that we were gonna go get really nice Tokyo foot rubs and and whatnot, and uh, we sat down and and they come and they you know clean your feet and they scrub your feet and whatnot and get you ready for the the massage and. They came to me with sandals for the transfer from the cleaning area to the massage area. And these sandals were the largest sandals they have. And they literally were like half the size of my size 14 foot. <laughs> so I'm wondering if if this capsule value in Conda oh is, my goodness. Is, is, you know, able to accommodate someone like me that's six feet foot four and you know a rather large individual yeah yeah i i totally think that's a a very likely concern that you should have i don't i bet you couldn't fit probably not probably yeah maybe maybe if i broke my legs (laughs) <laughs> yeah break them fold them up backwards it'll be uh yeah. it'll be perfect uh, and a good look for you too plus it'll uh actually uh make me uh feel like i'm not a midget when i'm hanging out with you and bruce ford because i'm getting real tired of being uh tiny that being said i was at a wedding last weekend down in um uh, at a at a great vineyard in uh virginia and i was with my family and they're all much 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 older than me i've got a very tiny family and the good news was uh, they've all shrunken down there to, to so small that I felt like you do when you're hanging out with, with me. So at least now I know what it's like to uh, be head and shoulders above the rest uh, figuratively and literally. You'll, you'll still never know what it's like to go down every grocery aisle and have some old lady ask you to get something in the back of the uh, top shelf. No, I, 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 I will not. Mostly people just look at me and then look at the tall guy next to me and say, hey, <laughs> can you uh, help with, with that? Or it probably comes off as more like, Sonny, can you uh, help with the, that? All right. So anyway, um, uh, Jeff, that was great. I really love these lists, and it's always fun um, having you on, on the show. So thanks for being here today. Any, uh, any hey. uh, sh- shameless plug that you want to make? Thanks for having me. Uh, no, uh, you know, listen to the podcast. I hope you guys enjoy them. I hope you enjoy what we're doing. And uh, again, download, listen, uh, give us reviews. That would be really, really helpful, uh, either on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And uh, uh, tell us how badly or poorly I pronounce pronounce things on the reviews, but say it's still a great show. That would be, yeah, that's great. I love that you couldn't pronounce pronounced which was really 
<laughs> awesome. I'm, but I understand. I'm, st- I'm, st- I'm still worried about my dog eating a bumblebee earlier in the recording. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, a little uh, thing behind the scenes. At around the two-minute mark, we actually had to stop the show because, uh, you know, Jeff's dog ate a bee, which uh, I understand is really tasty meal. Tastes like honey, which is good. So I want to thank you guys for listening. If you're feeling a little bit generous, join us at patreon.com slash no vacancy. Kick a few bucks our way. We'd really, uh, we'd really appreciate it. So, you know, it's not so easy bringing you all this great content every single week now for two years. And uh, hey, if you got a few bucks, maybe you could uh, give it to us. So, you know, we'll have a beer in your honor, preferably before staying in one of those uh, capsule hotels and not the one that's in the middle of the English Channel. I'm not going to fall off the side of it. But all right. So this has all been wonderful. But now I'm on my way. Stay tuned. We got another great interview coming up right after this commercial break. Have a question for your host, Glenn? Tweet him now at Traveling Glenn. No vacancy. The hospitality industry's number one podcast will be right back. Hey, everybody. I'm excited to let you know that on Monday, just in time for high tech, I'm launching a brand new 10 episode series, the Hotel Tech Podcast. I'm partnering with SHR, that's Scepter Hospitality Resources, and I've got myself an incredible co-host for this, Estella Hale, who's their chief product evangelist. We're going to talk everything hotel technology, everything that you need to know about understanding the incredible changes that are happening in our business. So check it out. Coming Monday, 10 episode first season, the Hotel Tech Podcast with me, Glenn Hausman and Estella Hale. Listen out for it. Back to the show. It's No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the No Vacancy Podcast with me, Glenn Hausman. I'm coming at you from the Embassy Suites, Midtown in New York City. Brand new-ish hotel opened in January. It still has that amazing new hotel, which I, you know I love so much, traveling around doing great stuff. So today, I'm in Manhattan. I'm not talking to someone from NBC Suites. No, I'm talking to uh, Shruti Gandhi Buckley, and she is in charge of Hampton Inn. Uh, Shruti, how are That's you today? Right. Go Hampton. I am great. Go Thank Hampton you so much. I, Even on a dreary Sunday, it's all good. Uh, well, anytime I'm with you, it's not well, dreary <laughs> at, at, at all. Thank you for that. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with the spring. It's either 90 degrees out or 50 degrees and raining. I know. It's killing me, and I can't uh, figure out what to wear, and it's a bad hair day one day, and... Good hair, Jay, another, and it's all over the place. That's why you just got to go short like <laughs> I did. There we go. So, and, and then if you just go one step further and act like me, you just give up completely and not even worry about how I'm, you look I'm anymore. I'm almost there. Yeah. Almost there. Well, you know, as you can see, and the, the, the listeners at home can't, I just showed up in uh, jeans and sneakers and all that because I've realized, Rudy, that a lot of the CEOs now are moving to the sneaker thing. Yes, they are. And I think it's because they think they're cool. They want to appear cool. Right. That's exactly right. Do I'm you trying think to, they are cool, though? That's a question. Well, they're a hell of a lot cooler than me. <laughs> so I'm trying, to, I'm trying to pretend I'm them by taking on their look. I was good with the no tie thing at financial conferences for a while, but now I've just, I'm just going all the way and off. And you know the, you've uh, got like thing. the... Uh, millennial right. little, cool little, little cool sneakers cool. going on. Yeah. I like it. Right, thank you. I appreciate that. I did go. it all myself. But I did buy some new suits yesterday, which uh, did you? Where are you being... going to wear a suit to? Who wears a suit anymore? Well, I have to for this NYU investment oh, conference that right. we're speaking at prior to. Right. Which is, <laughs> Good point. Which is very difficult. But I still won't be wearing a tie at first. So don't worry about that. <laughs> all right. So I guess we should actually talk about what we're here today. So how long have you been running Hampton? now gosh uh just shy of eight months now it seems like you just arrived but you've been here for a while you know i feel the same which is actually great because one of the things that to me has been um i think really helpful in in coming on to my new role is the welcoming hospitality environment of hilton so i feel like it's been a really easy transition good which is great and a lot of the owners are the same for my past life as they are here Right. So it's great to work with a lot of the same great individuals that I had the pleasure of uh, working with in the past. Is it strange working um, with them from a different company's perspective? No. You know, because that's what's so great about this business is the relationships, regardless of what company you're with, Mm -hmm. still uh, maintain so and, true. and that's that's one of the things that I love most about this business, actually, is right. the relationships you build, not only with folks you're working with, but also the owners. Right. And I see that with the uh, the franchise sales folks all the time, because I think all of them have worked right. for all of the companies yes, that's true. <laughs> at one Good time or another. But to be fair, it's the same thing on the editorial side. Everyone just kind of does a dance and goes around in a, a circle over their the, the length of their career. But, um, you know, it's great to see you aboard and stuff like that, but it must be odd to... 
like, you have such big shoes to fill, you know, uh, literally well, speaking. I was going to say, Cardell, Phil, yes. Yeah, pun intended, I'll say. <laughs> I didn't think about it at first. But, yeah, so what's that like taking over um, a role for a brand that's so established with the person who helped establish such a great brand? Yeah, actually really exciting. First yeah. of all, I was. I would have thought scary, intimidating, put my, uh, you know, put my head in a closet you and not come out. Not at all, and I'll tell you why. First of all, I had the great pleasure of working side by side with Phil for the right. first six to seven months before I took on the role. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I knew Phil before I even started and knew this brand so well, right. having worked with a key competitor and uh, for eight years prior to joining Hilton. So I followed this brand like a hawk, mm -hmm. right? Every, every uh, you know, new innovation that came out, all their performance numbers, what owners were saying, what guests were saying. So I felt like I already had a really good feel for right. the brand mm -hmm. coming on board. And so actually the transition has been, I would call it smooth. Um, and, and that's been really terrific. Also, incredible support from the Hilton team, incredible support from the owners. And I think the brand now, it's going into a very different life cycle, right? It was, right. It was incredible innovator, which Phil was the mastermind of, really creating, I think, one of the best brands in the industry ever. And now there's a little bit of a mind shift happening as consumer dynamics have really changed. Uh, the competitive environment has really changed. And we have really now have to look at the brand in a different way as we continue to expand globally now, almost 2,500 units. How do we maintain that consistency? How do we keep right. innovating when the stakes are higher and the expectations are higher, both from owners as well as from consumers? And it's interesting to me how you, you come into a brand that is so well established and, and been around for a, a long time. I look at you know some of your colleagues that are starting newer brands. Yeah. And, um, you know, they, they they have a different way of doing things because they're able to sign up a lot of new properties and you get that amazing pipeline growth. But you're already pretty much everywhere that you could be here in the United States, at, at least. So it's a different set of challenges, I, I would expect, as, as well. So when you come into a job that's true. with a brand that's so fully established, what are the first things that you're thinking about in terms of helping propel that brand to the future. And of course, we'll get into the whole That's global right. thing and changing consumer and all that. Sure. Stuff. And, and I'll say it's almost like running two brands right now, because to your point in the U.S., it's a well-established yeah. legacy brand, right? That has incredible distribution. And then overseas, it's a new emerging brand that was basically the Hilton of the U.S. several years back. Right. So it, the mind shift really changes depending on what part of the world I'm focused on. Mm -hmm. When we speak about the U.S., really innovation's got to be still the foundation for this brand, along with hospitality. I think the one thing that this brand has done better than any other brand, uh, definitely in its category, some will say even in the industry, is its commitment to delivering on guest service in a way that no other brand has been able to do, and consistently right. from one hotel to another, which is not an easy thing to do when you have over 2,000 hotels. Well, it seems like from my point of view as a consumer, it's really easy because everywhere I go, I feel um, the same sense of confidence in the brand when I stay with it. That's great to hear. And that's what we hear from our guests. Mm -hmm. So how do we continue to maintain that? Right, right. And so I think there's already a really great baseline in establishing and creating this, what we call almost a culture movement at the hotel, which is really remarkable to see. It's the passion and commitment these team members bring to the table, which again is really interesting considering this brand is highly franchised, mm -hmm. right? So we don't manage many of the team members that are there, but they have such passion and love for this brand. So we continue to beat the drum and continue to share the great story that this brand has at table, but continue to also make an investment in team member training, team member um, service execution, and keep our eye on the ball so that we don't lose that key differentiator. Right, and to, I think to, to me, it's the people that mean so much. And I say, and for you listeners out there, You're you right. know I say this a lot. It's true. Because I think that, and again, I've said this before, so many brands have done such a great job at connecting with customers and creating a great product yes. that you're already 98% of the way there. So it's this, that little wiggle room that you have to really differentiate yourself. And that's a lot through the people. Yeah, that's exactly right. So how do you make sure that you're training the people to actually connect with guests in a meaningful way as opposed to just hey, you know, have this cup of coffee or thanks for coming. Yeah, I mean, without, you know, getting sort of too technical, I think, first of all, we are big believers in strength-based training and really underst understanding what the strengths are of each individual that is at the hotel and then helping them leverage those strengths to bring out 
their energy and their passion and their excitement in terms of being able to service the guest. I think the other thing that really has been the foundation for this brand is the Hampton Guarantee, which has evolved over time, right? Mm -hmm. It started out as the 100% money back guarantee. It's evolved into uh, the happiness guarantee, which right. is something that we very consciously made an, a, a stride towards because what we found is guests said, business guests in particular, we don't really want our money back. What we are looking for is number one, be proactive. Number two, just be, um, anytime there is an issue, solve it and solve it quickly. Right. And so that was really a mind shift change over the last sort of year, year and a half where we sort of transitioned to that point. Um, but rallying the team, there's, there's constant communication, there's investment in tools and resources, but also seeing how they're absorbing information differently. Right. And we're looking at different ways to do, uh, send information and train them in small segments versus here's your workbook and here's three hours worth of training. I think we really innovated the way that we are now training all of our team members across the world. I'll tell you, uh, one time I, I got the, uh, the, the money back uh, from the 100% guarantee and it wasn't even something I was looking for to kind of go into to your point. But how did it make you feel? Uh, it made me feel really great but also guilty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah, because I felt like, I felt like, I mean, my problem was really small in the scheme of things. And honestly, I don't even remember what it was because this is going back 10 years ago. But I remember getting the guarantee and not yeah. having to pay for the room that night. And I felt really bad for the hotel owner because I was in town for uh, a major concert event type of thing. And for uh, everyone who listens, you know, I was in Hampton, Virginia for some fish shows, right? So it's a big deal. I know that they were charging a lot of money for yes. the rooms. And yeah, I had this little tiny problem and then they were so willing to, to give it up. And I think that says a lot about the ownership that they are willing to just jump in on something. A like absolutely. That. And I'll say, even though we don't promote the guarantee as a 100% money back guarantee, right. It's still a big part of the program. However, I think you pointed to a great point, which is really it's about the little things that make a big difference. Right. And that's what we're focusing a lot of our training on. And we're seeing incredible results and it's resonating, which is why we continue to lead the category in terms of brand love and right. why people continue to come back to the brand. And, you know, we talk a lot in, in this business about that the instant recognition and stuff like that. And I know we're not at a Hampton today. We're at an Embassy Suites. But I got to tell you, when I checked in today and I got my waters and I got my M&M &M peanuts. Yeah. Yeah. And then they threw in an extra M&M &M peanuts. And then they said, do you also want a Snickers and a Reese's Pieces? I was, like, really excited by it. But I had to say, no, I can't I can't take all this much chocolate in, in my life. But <laughs> it made me feel really good. You yeah, know? And, absolutely. And I think that's really uh, important. And to me, that was a, a real meaningful interaction Great that I point. had with somebody. Well, and what's interesting, and it's changing a dynamic, a dynamic a little bit in terms of um, – recognition is digital key, right? Mm -hmm. So Hilton was at the forefront of launching digital key. Hampton was actually the first brand in the tier to right. come out with digital key. Uh, but now we are really having to innovate and change our mindset in terms of how we service the guests as they are bypassing a key point of contact, right? right with that, that individual, right? Especially in a limited service brand where we don't have a, a number of, of guest points. But what that has opened up the door to right. are the opportunities that, that exist and how do we focus in on, for example, breakfast service training, right? 85% right. of our guests take advantage of our free breakfast. That's a key touch point. All of the digital messaging that we have, how do we continue to reinforce and appreciate our most loyal members? So we are really, um, I think, moving forward and being at the forefront in those areas for Hilton and then, of course, you know, Hampton leading the way in the, in the category. So going, um, going into the future then, that breakfast uh, personnel that are down there, I think are going to be really, really uh, critical. Yes. Now, I've spoken on this show numerous times with uh, Adrian, uh, Adrian Curry. Yes. Right? Um, an, another brand uh, leader. Who's, that's right. Who's One of my great counterparts. Stay, right? And, um, you know, we always joke around that the last person that's going to be left standing in the hotel is going to be the bartender. Right? And how important they are. But also, on a serious note, I do yeah. think it's also the, the, the people that are focused on you in breakfast where you're going to have those, those conversations with them. So, how do you adapt the culture to make sure that you you are connecting with the guests in those new kind of ways and also not just telling owners that they could just go ahead and get rid of all of their staff because I think that'll be dangerous too. Well, exactly. And I think this is one of the things that Hilton in general across all their brands, particularly with Hampton, is we take our brand standards very seriously. Yeah. We take our labor model very seriously. Again, we command a 20% premium over the chain scale. So we have to be very wow. mindful, mm -hmm. which is pretty remarkable um, as to how we service the guests because when you're paying more than, than some of the competitors, your expectations are going to be higher. Mm -hmm. So that's always forefront. And our owners understand that. Um, 
And so it is It is that kind of change. I would say it doesn't really change. It's an evolution. Mm -hmm. It's a shift in culture. Right. And we're seeing that shift take place. And Digital Key is rolling out. Uh, so it, it, although it launched in our hotels, it is progressively more and more people are taking advantage of that. So what it's allowing us to do is take learnings from those hotels that were first out the door, leverage those learnings. We're also speaking directly, mm -hmm. not only to the guests, but also to our team members. You know, what's right. working, what isn't working. And they've always been part of the process. Our owners are really part of the process and the brainstorming and coming up with the great ideas on how do we evolve the way we service the guests as technology is coming in um, strong. Yeah, I don't know if I can handle the uh, the digital key. I think it's a great idea, but me uh, Have you tried it? It's Yes, it's good. It's convenient. But at the same time, I always worry that my phone's going to drop know, dead. You know and, uh, Look, that is... I just can't be trusted with <laughs> it's really what it comes down to. It's not you, it, it's me. <laughs> well, here's what I'll say, yeah. right? I think when you think about it, especially uh, audiences now are used to using digital technology, right. right? I mean, mm -hmm. at the airport, the train, nobody's now going up to the front lot desk unless there's a problem um, when it comes to travel. That's and right. so now it was only natural that the hotels move in that direction. I think Hilton was really smart and innovative and in saying, we're going to do this and we're going to do it fast. We're going to be the first to the table with it. Um, but... We're now all sort of working on, okay, what does that mean? What does that mean for honors recognition? What does it mean right. for guests? How do we continue? What does it mean for training of the, of the team members? Oh, so that is a question. So, you know, because I can get my water as a, an honors member when I check in, but if I'm not going to the front desk, how can I make sure I still get my water? Will you bring it to the room? So you are asking a great question. There is great work happening. I can't share with you at this point in time, but we are looking across honors recognition in general, and we're really going to make some great um, adaptations to how we service the guests based on right. digital key, and more to come on that towards the end of this year or early next year. All right. I, I, I know when I'm told to move on, but I will say it's, uh, it's either going to be a robot, or if you need a good mini bar guy, <laughs> I got a guy to put you well, in you touch got a, Is that you? Are you the guy? No, no, but I got a guy. Every, you know, I, you gotta Everybody's have a guy. got a guy. I do. I, I do. Everybody's yeah. got a guy. They pretty much have all the mini bars uh, locked up in, in, um, in Las Vegas. Really? Really, really good people. So, all right. So, what's going on now globally? We teased it a little yes. bit, but you're rolling out globally now. How do you bring a, uh, a brand that hasn't been known and bring it to different countries and cultures? That's right. So, if I can just backtrack just a little Absolutely. bit. Absolutely. Because it, it, there's a global effort that's taking place, and then I'll specifically talk about international. So as we think about how guest needs, we talked about this a little bit earlier, evolving and changing, right? Instant gratification, right? They're used to now in the retail environment, their expectations have been changed by retailers now that are up, up in quality, um, but yet the price point is really affordable. And that's what Hampton really was the forefront of doing in, in the hospitality industry. So how do we keep on top of that? So I think a couple of things. First of all, globally, so not just in the U.S., we're really looking and speaking to our guests and doing a lot of research because we also understand that the guest needs in different markets Markets based on what they're used to, the competitive dynamics change are, are different. Um, and that is giving us some really great insights on how we're evolving the brand from a product and design standpoint, as well as from guest amenities, whether it's breakfast, fitness, etc. So we're really focused there. Uh, so in the U.S., we just launched a really exciting new prototype and new design package that really helps uh, bring Hampton, sort of ensure and solidify its relevancy into the future. And then overseas, we're doing the same thing. So we have research. We, we also keep a real tight pulse, not only on what's happening in our industry, but what are design trends, food and beverage trends that are happening um, outside of the industry that we are trying to leverage so that we can continue to stay at the forefront and move things right. forward. And that's what we're doing overseas. Okay, now that gets me excited when you start thinking about um, other industries because yeah. I'm, I'm finding, especially with the design community, uh, yes. when I speak to them and I ask them the question, where do you get inspiration? A lot of them will say automotive or mm. you know architecture or, or something uh, like that. Yeah. So what are some of the industries that you look at? Because uh, you know, we're here for a particular forum that took place today, Women's Leadership Forum, and you were saying during the discussion that you've very actively look at, uh, at other industries. Yeah, so what, do you, what gets you excited in, in other industries? Well, it's interesting. When you look at fashion, fashion is really a reflection of design, right? right? So that's a really great indicator on what should our hotels look like and feel like. It also is, is, the, um, is fashion going more formal? Is it going more casual? And that all leads to what kind of environment people are looking for in terms of the hotels. Home furnishing trends is another great trend, right? How people live in their homes, that's oftentimes how they want to live right. when they're, they're traveling. Um, and I think the, the bringing it quickly is the key, 
bringing it at an affordable price point, but really making it approachable and comfortable. So you, earlier you opened up the dialogue around your in your jeans, right. and you know everybody's wearing tennis shoes now. And I think that's what Hampton has done so beautifully is create not only innovation, but done it in a way that's really comfortable and inviting. Right, that's been the secret sauce for this brand. Right, we are very approachable, and we do it consistently across. Now, almost 2,500 hotels globally. Okay, so fashion could be fickle and fleeting, right? So how do you in, how do you incorporate those ideas into a brand that needs to consider the ownership needs? Because yeah. I know owners are getting sick and tired of everyone coming in and saying, you got to change this, you got to change this, you got to change right. this over and over again. So we do it very mindfully. Mm-hmm. So if you, it all starts with the, the positioning and what the brand stands for. Mm-hmm. So if you think about Hampton and Hamptonality, for example, it is sort of those... I sometimes get that confused with lessonality myself. But, but, but <laughs> I'm glad I'm gonna you're going to finally straight. clear me up I'm gonna on this. St- I'm going to set you straight there. Uh, unless Florence Henderson comes in and starts singing about lessonality. Yes, timely reference from well, the 80s. It, it's also understanding how guests live, yes. right? So sometimes it is, it's about textural elements. It's about, wow, now you're seeing just more organic elements coming into a variety of different, whether mm-hmm. it's retail, mm-hmm. restaurant mm-hmm. spaces, right? Design trends. Um, how do we bring that, which warms up the space and brings a much more inviting atmosphere to hotels? And those are actually classic elements. So I, I would say specifically for Hampton, we wouldn't call ourselves a trendy brand. I would say we would call ourselves a contemporary forward-thinking brand that has a classic uh, foundation to it, right? right? So I'm not going to go look in for the acid green tile that might have to be changed and be unfortunately not relevant in three years. I, we are really looking at the materials, the functionality, the way the space feels, and is that space going to feel and look um, as relevant today as it will six, seven years from now, right? So, for example, you're going to furnish your home. Right. Most people are not going to redo their houses every three to five no, to six years, There's right? a reason why my parents had olive green uh, appliances right. into the 90s. <laughs> That's right. But I think we've gotten smarter and savvier, and we've got such an incredible design house in, internally where we've really honed in on some of those capabilities. Right. Um, and travel as well. So I spend a lot of my time, I have growing up, trying to get 50 countries by the time I'm 50. That's my big goal. Nice. Um, but, but traveling all over the world. For of you, have plenty of time. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad that $20 I slipped you worked. Oh, I thought it was 50 Never mind. <laughs> but I, when it comes to design, actually, I think a lot of overseas markets right. are a little more forward thinking. And so leveraging some of those thoughts and those dynamics um, allows us to be ahead of the game, right. but yet not trendy. But we look at classic materials that won't get outdated. Okay. I think that makes a lot of sense. And honestly, when I'm thinking about Hampton, I'm not really going there, as you indicated, for some forward-thinking design elements. I'm looking, I think, if I had to put it, i put it more like um, Nouvelle Cuisine versus Comfort Foods. Oh, uh, right? yeah. You know, like, and there's a place for both. There's a place for both. Yes. And w- when I'm, I'm with Hampton, I want that, that comfy, cozy feeling. That's right. Of, and the consistency. It. And that sense of security. That's right. Right? So that makes a lot of sense to me. So how do you then take that out now? We've got to get back to that global question yes. and roll it out to different countries and continents that's right and because they're not americans over there so you're talking about a lot of different types of culture so how do you create a a prototype that works that is definitively hampton but isn't locked into being definitively hampton that's right i think two things right so first of all it's think globally act locally which mm-hmm. um is not so did I you knew- pick that up in your national geography that's <laughs> I did, I did. (laughs) But it is, before we go into a market, we're doing our due diligence and really understanding what the consumer dynamics are, but making sure we're still very true to the brand positioning and who we are. So we don't have a Taj Mahal Hampton, right? It Mm -hmm. is, in fact, very relevant for that consumer, that specific market. You say that now, but then one of the franchise guys will sell it. (laughs) Well, you know, and that's where the conversation, the relationship comes Mm -hmm. into play. Look, and, and, and this is the benefit of a brand that has had this much success in this country for this long that we're able to leverage the consistency of the brand and say we have a trusted relationship with owners that they buy into it as soon as even they're a new owner because they've seen what we've done with this brand Mm -hmm. over the course of time. Sometimes some owners get a little zealous and they're really excited, particularly if it's a new market and they want to sort of create Hampton into something that they feel is relevant for the market. That's where the consumer research comes into place to be able to sort of cut through the opinion and say, let's really understand what the competitive dynamics are. Let's understand the market. Let's hear what the consumers are saying. And let's, and by the way, owner, we also 
have standards in place and have criteria to help ensure that this is going to be operationally efficient for you and it's going to be a great return on your investment. Right. And all of a sudden, that's the language that ends up allowing us to come together. All right. Awesome. I want to talk to you a little bit about your personal journey, but is there any talking points that we didn't that I didn't ramble into accidentally for, uh, for what you want to get you out know, today? Here's, here's what I'll say about this brand. I think you are going to see really exciting innovation and evolution. We are not a revolution, a brand that needs revolution because we're so healthy and so strong. Right, absolutely. It is evolutionary changes through time, right? That's been the secret sauce of the past. We're going to continue to, to leverage that secret sauce for the future. And I really look forward to sharing with you sort of more things that are going to be happening in terms of our guest experience evolution over the next six to eight months. So yeah. stay uh, tuned. Well, it's a very polite way of saying uh, buzz off. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. So, um, you know, Tell me a little bit about how you got to where you are. What was your journey like? I'd love to. I'd love to hear the stories of how people go from you know zero to hero. Yes. So I've had, I would say, somewhat of a non-traditional path into hospitality, but there's a little bit of, of sort of deep-rooted, uh, I would say, past that's, that's embedded there. So I actually have, have spent over 25 years in branding and marketing, um, and so that's my real passion is running businesses. And you started in first grade. I started, <laughs> actually, I ran my own catering business when I was in college. No way. Yes, I did. Uh, University of California, Berkeley. Yeah, go nice. Bears. <laughs> um, and so, uh, actually, uh, it, it was a program that they had where they were asking, uh, they had spaces that you could rent out, but you had mm -hmm. to submit a whole business proposal. And I had two friends of mine, and we said, we are going to start our own business. And so, that was kind of the start of getting into into marketing and business management. Um, but I actually, and, and that led my way to Nestle. So I started in the right. food industry after college. Right. Then I said, wow, I love fashion. I love cosmetics. So I made my way into luxury cosmetics, living in New York City and traveled the world, which was really great. Right. Um, and then, you know, really had several points in, in my career where I really wanted to make a change. So I moved down to DC. I said, I really want to work for a cause-based organization. Uh, made my way, you mentioned National Geographic, yes. spent several years there. And then it came to a point where I said, what's my next step? And that's when I really drew on some of my past experiences. My uncle mm -hmm. owned a, a two-story hotel in, in Atlantic City, New Jersey. So every summer, I grew, and they were owner-operators. They actually lived on the property. Um, so I would go for two to three weeks every summer since the age of What year-ish is this? I am I'm not going to give that away. I, all right. <laughs> it was a very long time ago. I, I just uh, The reason why I say that is because, uh, you know, the, the pre- and post-gambling eras and all of that kind oh, of stuff. So definitely way before there were any casinos, okay. right? This is when Atlantic City was really a, a family destination. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and two blocks on the beach, great location. But it was a two-story exterior corridor right. with a pool in the middle. They lived there. So I lived at the hotel for two to three weeks every summer, growing um. up from the age of six onwards until they sold the property many years later. And so when it came time for me to say, well, what is it that I really want to do? A couple of things happened. Um, I, I said, well, what do I love? I love travel. Uh, what are the things that, that um, I, I was really looking for a whole new experience? I said, I've done products that sit on a shelf. National Geographic was interesting because it's about creating, uh, giving back and sort of cause related. And then I had friends because DC is the hospitality hub, right? Three right. major companies. I had a few friends who were actually in the hospitality industry. And so we started to talk and I said, share with me what you do. How does it work? How does this industry function? And because I had spent so many of my years traveling and living in Japan, living in Switzerland, you know, making my wow. way around the world, um, I spent a lot of time in hotels. And it seemed like a natural fit. And then as I started to think about it, I said, this is really one of the few industries where people are actually living with you. You actually have an impact on a part of their life, which I found so fascinating. Yeah. But it's also complicated. Um, you not just have the guests as a stakeholder in that experience mm -hmm. and you want it to make such a, a, a really great impact while they're there living with you, but also the owner stakeholder, which I found really fascinating and, right. and balancing that. Um, and that's really what to me sold me on. I, I, I really want to see if I can make this work. And I was given a really unique opportunity with zero hospitality experience to lead a very large brand at a leading competitor for many years. That's amazing. Which was pretty risky. And yeah. imagine, uh, not, not an easy first year or two when you're having to convince a bunch of owners that you really do know what you're talking about when right. you really don't. Yeah, right. <laughs> right? You're, what, what does RevPar mean again? Um, and after... Uh, but you could talk about Nestle Crunch Bar for, <laughs> for hours. Go, uh, for hours. Yeah. Fashion, high heels, no problem. 
Um, but you know what? It was also the best way to learn the industry. And I actually mm-hmm. spent several months rotationally training. I worked in maintenance. I worked in housekeeping. Oh, I worked in front desk. I said, that's the only way I'm really going to understand um, how this business functions, right? And the operational complexity of, of, of hospitality. And so after many years of turning around uh, a brand, which was a really great experience, um, and then actually assuming another responsibility for a brand overseas in Africa. Wow. Yeah, so that was great, right? That's a really dynamic, changing environment over there. Um, That's really what led me to Hilton. I think they were looking for somebody who had broad experience, who understood the tier. And I was fortunate to to have an opportunity to speak to Phil. And that's what led to me coming on to Hilton and eventually taking over the Hampton brand. And you know, it's, it's funny. It's the brand that I chased for so many years, I mentioned earlier, right. and, and now to actually have the opportunity to lead this incredible brand, it's, um, I, I won't lie to you, it's, it keeps me up at night, but it also gets me up in the morning to say, how do I make sure that we maintain the leadership position of this brand? Well, it's got to be something that's extremely amazing and stimulating, but also horrifically frightening at the same time. Because I just think about what it was like for me starting my own business and, you know, the odds, the stakes that there are, and you, you're playing a really high stakes game in a way because you don't want to fail. Right. Not on my watch. Right. Right. But it's also a great motivator and a great opportunity. Uh, and I will say Hilton as an organization has been incredibly supportive. We have, right, this, this company believes in this brand wholeheartedly. There's incredible investment. That's been also a, another great secret to its success is continued investment. So they continue to, to do that. Um, and also surrounding myself with great people in the organization. And now that I've been here long enough, I've made my way. I've built the relationships internally. We have great owners partnering with them and, and leveraging the relationship I have with them from my past. So it's been a really, it's been a, a great transition. Does it keep me up at night? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's a lot at stake, but I know that we also have an incredible plan and great future ahead of us. And the fact that this brand continues to command a 20% premium, right? Fastest growing brand at Hilton. Yep. Over 600 in the pipeline. Wow. Uh, which is pretty remarkable. That um, uh, that gives me a lot of confidence. So the, the fear is, is not there but I would say the, the momentum certainly is. Well, you're, you're a total pro. I love how you keep bringing back the talking points and all of that into it so seamlessly. <laughs> it was amazing. Before we wrap up, any advice that you would give folks that are just coming up at the, uh, the earlier parts of their career? Yeah, I would say um, talk to as many people as you can. I think that's different industries, different levels. Um, I think that's one thing. Surround yourself by people who are also going to inspire you. And, and, and give you ideas. And don't be afraid to take some chances and some risks. I certainly did. It was not always an easy start in some of the transitions I made from one industry to another. Yep. But it always paid off in the end. Um, and don't sell yourself short. Nice. Because I think, I think we oftentimes do. We're hard on ourselves. But you always can, can do it. You just got to believe. Well, yeah. Well, I think it's part of human nature to be really hard on yourself. That's and true. if you're not too hard on yourself, then you're probably not as successful as you could be. But, you know, Fair that's enough. my unsolicited advice for all of you guys uh, and ladies out there. All right. So, uh, Shirley, thanks for being here. Thank you so much. you got to give a shameless plug, though. You know, tell us how we could uh, find uh, Hampton and maybe if there's so someone wants to develop one. Or here that here is – <laughs> I think here's the great thing. So, Hampton by Hilton truly is everywhere you want to be. We have – Near at the end of this year, we'll have 2,500 properties in 23 countries around the world. And I would say definitely, if you're interested in building and developing a Hampton, please give us a call. And, and if you're interested in staying a Hampton, so you've got so many fabulous loyal guests, Hilton.com. That's where you'll find us. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. And for Shruti and myself, thanks for listening. And I'll be back next week. That is, unless I decide to go, I don't know, join Nestle or National Geographic <laughs> magazine. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening to No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman, online at Rouse.media, on Twitter at Traveling Glenn, and on Facebook.com slash Glenn.Hausman. We'll catch you next time.